So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, quick introduction, Patients Engage is an online platform. We are operational for over five years and focused on holistic and evidence-based management of chronic conditions from the perspective of patients as well as family caregivers. Uh, we strongly believe in the value of lived experiences and we believe that you know, if you are better informed, it leads to better uh, information, better engagement, as well as, uh, uh, you know, you feel empowered to take the right decisions. Uh, and it eventually therefore results in better quality of life. Um, today, we are here to talk about dementia care and specifically home-based dementia care. Uh, dementia care is challenging, you know, always challenging actually, but in COVID times, it's actually become even more challenging. Um, and we are very privileged to have with us uh, a very interesting panel. We have Dr. Sridhar Vaitiswaran, who's a consultant psychiatrist and uh, heads uh, an organization called DEMCARES uh, at uh, SCARF, Schizophrenia Research Foundation in Chennai. Um, we have Mangala Joglekar, who is a professional social worker who runs the memory clinic at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital in Pune, as well as an Alzheimer's support group. Um, we have Gomti Radhakrishnan, who has been a caregiver to her mother-in-law until uh, just over, just under two years ago, and also supports uh, DemCares and the caregivers at DemCares actively. Um, quick guidance, quick uh, house rules. Uh, the information here is not to be taken as a medical consultation. Uh, we do have a doctor, but you know this will be fairly generic information. Uh, but you can ask your question. We will address as best as we can. This session is being recorded. So if you're logged into Zoom, you can post your questions on the Q&A button at the bottom. And if you are on Facebook, you can post it on the live feed. Uh, we will pick the questions up from there. And if you have any experience to share, you can always write to us, uh, good, bad, ugly at editor at patientsengage.com. And uh, our website is patientsengage.com. And we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube is where all of these webinar recordings go. Uh, and you can also download our app. So let me stop the thing and let's quickly introduce our panelists a little bit more. Uh, let me start with you, Dr. Sridhar. If you can tell us a little bit about uh, DemCares, it will help the audience. Um, thanks for having us here today, and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to discuss some of the uh, you know, unusual problems that people with dementia usually undergo. And it's, uh, we started DemCare, Dementia Care and SCARF in 2015, and that's primarily to help uh, people with dementia and their caregivers to receive the most evidence-based interventions that uh, can be made available in our country. So that's, that's our uh, aim and our uh, service motto. And uh, we, we have a memory clinic and we also offer cognitive stimulation therapy. Uh, we offer, uh, we are currently testing um, specific interventions for caregivers, uh, which are adapted for India. Um, and we also uh, support our support group of caregivers quite actively. Um, and, and also we are involved in a lot of research. Right, thank you, Dr. Okay. Sridhar. Uh, Mangala, do you want to talk a little yes. bit about yourself and yes. the work you do? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for having me here on this platform. Uh, I started the uh, memory clinic in Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. Uh, it works under the neurology department and in 2010. And in the same year, I started the Alzheimer's support group also. And through both of these uh, setups, I have been working for the dementia community. Uh, we have awareness programs, testing uh, programs for the patients, as well as for the caregivers, Alzheimer's support group, home visits, and uh, training programs also. And uh, we also have memory clubs for brain fitness, and we work with normal citizens. So the memory clubs are for the normal citizens. So we have a wide uh, spectrum of activities for the dementia community. Right. Uh, Gomti, if you can please introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. 
I have been a caregiver for my mother-in-law who had suffered Alzheimer's from 2008 and until the time she passed away till 2018, 10, 10 years of caregiving. I'm here to share my experiences as a caregiver. And we are also part of a support group, DemCare support group, where we meet monthly once and mm. support each other in ways, in terms of, you know, addressing their challenges. So right. that right. is a little about me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, doctor, let's start with the basic question. What is dementia? Because I think it still gets, uh, there's still a lot of confusion around it. Yes. Um, I think that's a very important question to start with. Thank you. Um, dementia is a term that we use to describe a collection of conditions which present with memory problems or other brain functions, such as language, recognition, ability to organize oneself and do activities uh, which our brain helps us to do. So the best analogy I can think of when we talk about dementia is when we say someone has fever. Mm. Uh, there are different causes for fever, different types of fever. So it could be malaria, dengue, and now uh, COVID. Mm. Now, similarly, dementia is a generic term which describes uh, a chronic degenerative process in the brain. It could right. be caused in many conditions. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. There are also other types of dementia, such as vascular dementia, dementia and Parkinson's disease, mixed type Alzheimer's and vascular, and so mm. on and so forth. There are so many different types of dementia. The most straightforward one. There are many conditions which can mimic dementia. Uh, mm. There are many problems which can present with memory problems in an elderly person. And it's very important to rule out some common reversible causes for these memory problems. Now, if you're able to do that, then you can actually prevent many problems later on in life diagnosis for dementia. That's one. The second general myth that nothing can be done for dementia is a myth. And mm. it is not true um, as definition of myth. Um, there are so many things which we can do for someone with dementia. Um, of course, it's like having diabetes or hypertension, for which, again, there is no permanent cure. There's no permanent treatment. Right. It doesn't mean that uh, people shouldn't get their uh, diagnosis of diabetes or diagnosis of hypertension. It's important you mm. check future complications. Similarly, for someone with dementia, if you're able to identify the illness early on, you can prevent a lot of complications later on in life. The other important opportunity it provides the family and also the person um, having dementia is that it gives them an understanding of what is happening to them and what's going on around them. I think that's extremely important. It gives them a sense mm -hmm. of um, control over what is happening in their lives and, and also gives them a, a, a direction about what they could do in the future. So what help that they can access. Again, accessing appropriate sources of help. Um, like uh, there are no, yes, there are no disease modifying treatments as yet, but we can slow down the illness uh, progression. Mm -hmm. We can actually prevent a lot of complications like behavioral problems, agitation, aggression, sleeplessness, and all that which happens later on uh, as dementia advances. We can prevent many of those issues. And also we can provide a lot of psychosocial interventions, which actually are non-medical interventions as they're called, and reduce caregiver distress. And of course, my favorite uh, kind of reason for getting a diagnosis is it gives people an opportunity to participate in research and also improve, uh, you know, the care for dementia and potential uh, therapies for dementia in the longer term. So these are some of the common reasons I can think of uh, why or important reasons why I can think of that people should get a diagnosis. Right. Um, so Gomti, uh, if you can talk about, so kind of some people recognize that dementia care is challenging, but I think often it's not really understood as to what is the most challenging aspect or why is it more challenging than any other, uh, you know, uh, elder care, uh, so to speak. So if you can, based on your personal experience, talk about why you think it's, it's more challenging than, you know, other conditions. Yeah. So, uh, during the initial stages of her uh, mother-in-law's Alzheimer's, we used to wonder, because she used to be an extremely disciplined person otherwise, suddenly uh, everything started changing slowly, slowly, suddenly she will have a cup of coffee and she will forget that she has had, she will had food and then she forget that she had food and then complain 
that I have not given her any food. But then being a very disciplined person, we were not able to take it. We were not able to cope with that behavior. And uh, but we were somehow managing because after all, food and coffee, it's OK. Mm. But then later on in the middle stages, like we were like shocked to see her uh, trying to take a phenyl bottle and drinking it as milk. So that is when we know we started uh, thinking, oh, my God, what is happening? So I said, what is this they are doing? She said, this is milk. Huh? Then that is where we thought uh, this behavior is uh, getting us uh, somewhere. We have to address this behavior. Uh, otherwise, earlier, we never used to, we never knew what is this dem dementia, never heard about Alzheimer's as such. And then another occasion when she started, you know, uh, asking us to open the door and leave her out so that she could go home and give her father-in-law a cup of coffee who has passed away 50 years ago. Mm. So all such behaviors were something very new to her personality. And that is how we thought of, uh, that is when exactly we thought of uh, uh, taking doctor's advice. Right. Till that time we were coping up, but when this phenyl occasion and this uh, trying to see her father-in-law who is no more, so all that was really a sort of a behavior which we, we never knew earlier. So right. all this uh, made us, you know, to seek uh, uh, doctor's advice. So that is when uh, actually we, 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 I should say that uh, there was a lapse in our, uh, you know, um, going to the doctor. I think we delayed. Hmm. Because we were not aware, aware of such behavior earlier. So we were not knowing what was happening to her. So okay. but then physically she was completely all right. But behavioral changes when we saw, we never correlated that it could be some disease. We thought that it will become better because she had, we had just lost our father-in-law. Uh, mm -hmm. And probably because of that, she is getting a little bit, uh, that change of behavior is noticeable. We mm. thought that way. But then right. when we thought that this is disturbing her lifestyle, it is disturbing her routine life, that is when we sought the intervention of a psychiatrist. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Gumti. Uh, Mangala, from your experience as, you know, running a, a support group as well as a memory care uh, clinic, why do you think dementia care is particularly challenging? Uh, it's very, very challenging, as Gomati said. The first challenge is that of accepting the diagnosis. Mm. You know, accepting the memory loss, accept, uh, accepting the decrease in cognitive abilities. You know, these are the main challenges because when the diagnosis is handed out, caregivers do not know anything about the disease. The okay. caregiving responsibility just falls into their lap and they don't know anything about it. What this, is, this disease is about, what is the caregiving process, what is the caregiver's role, they really don't know anything about it. So that is uh, the first challenge. The second challenge would be that of behavioral problems. Bhomati right. was uh, explaining a few behavioral challenges. But behavioral challenges are the ones which uh, increase the stress on the caregivers. And there are a lot of common uh, behavioral problems. For example, aggression and agitation is number one, irritability. Uh, then not listening to the caregivers. Many of them uh, feel that uh, whatever, because we have been doing so much for them that they should listen to us. So the third is, uh, you know, repetitive uh, behavior or uh, talking repetitively the same thing over and over again. Then wandering. Wandering is a very, very common problem and wandering happens in almost all the cases. Right. Hallucinations, not wanting to eat, not wanting to drink, not wanting to take medications, incontinence and sleeplessness. These are some of the common issues. And sleeplessness is really uh, very difficult for the caregivers because uh, if the patient is uh, sleeping through the day and awake through the night, then the caregiver cannot get any sleep at all. Correct. So this is the second set of problems. And as Gomati was saying, this is the reason why people refer to the doctor in the first mm -hmm. place. I mean, they come to the doctor two or three, later, two or three years later. And that is why, uh, you know, the treatment cannot be started early and they cannot receive optimum treatment. The third is uh, family conflict, I would say. If uh, the siblings are caring for the parent, mm. then uh, family conflict is uh, quite a major issue, according to my experience. Right. Uh, then uh, family not working as a team, 
caregiver working on one's own managing so many responsibilities um what else i think these are the major uh, kind of challenges right uh, and uh, along with all of this stress and strain that the caregiver has to fight and the effect it has on the physical and mental health of the caregiver for these challenges continue to pile up right so uh, the caregivers go on facing the challenges all throughout the caregiving journey okay okay thank you thank you hmm. um so how has covid made this uh, home based care more challenging um uh, dr shridhar do you want to kind of do an initial start on that sure um so there are various challenges which caregivers and persons with dementia face even at other times and right when you have a pandemic um, like covid and that has just made a lot of uh, raised a lot of issues and uh, created new problems for many families we did a study in chennai looking at our caregivers and talked to them about what uh, is happening to them during the covid Mm-hmm. and what we understood were uh, from the issues we could broadly classify these issues under two headings the first heading is the issues that are directly related to the caregiving process which is right. complicated by covid so all the challenges that the caregivers face in their day to day life providing care all that is being affected by the covid mm-hmm. and then you have the routine thing which all of us face everybody who lives in the community faces because of covid the mm-hmm. caregivers also face that so some issues like for example when you talk about uh, specific issues which the caregivers face the first important concern is protecting uh, right. the elderly person with dementia from exposure to covid because many people with dementia don't understand or cannot understand will be uh, restricted within their homes uh, why should be why should they wear a mask if they have to go out and why should they should they be washing their hands each time they go out and things like that so right. that becomes a point of contention between the person with dementia and the family and there is lots of uh, issues that the caregivers face the second important issue is if the person with dementia were to develop covid mm. how do we manage them so right. the generic hospitals uh, are not geared to manage someone with dementia So right. also the person with dementia will be separated from their family from their um, you know routine environment and that may potentially worsen the behavior and uh, and also when people wear masks and they come with full protection PPE it's very kits, difficult yeah. for exactly yeah. and it's very difficult for the person with dementia to understand what is going on around that may distress them even further so those were uh, sorry there's a lot of rain and thunder yes. here in the mid just now <laughs> the other uh, important bit is when we yeah. talk about day to day routine of persons mm-hmm. with dementia so mm-hmm. when you have uh, because of covid lots of outdoor activities have been restricted and uh, the day centers are closed so people are restricted within their homes and their routines have changed and this mm-hmm. has caused a lot of uh, new problems for families people with dementia are bored they are otherwise not engaged that creates Uh, them to become agitated and all that so that follows on with increased behavioral uh, symptoms that we see in people with dementia um, i've had lots of examples by which uh, when someone who usually goes out to a day center is restricted within the house mm. and the, the 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 family is trying to work from home so lots right. of people are are working from home and the person dementia doesn't understand why nobody is spending time with them they mm. go and knock on the door they become very disruptive and agitated during this period with a lot of issues the other important issue is health and well being of someone with dementia during this period of time so mm. even at best of time there are lots of uh, studies and a lot of uh, reports we know of that people with dementia don't get the best of medical care and medical attention mm. um, and the pandemic has just made it worse because people are not able to access their doctors they're right. not able to get the medicines for various things i've had numerous examples of skin problems dental issues uh, mm. people with uh, you know heart disease unable to go for routine reviews with their doctors and unable to uh, you know change medicines if they have to so lots of issues like that and again the other important issue is access to parks access to you know walking spaces right uh, when people with dementia during the lock on the peak of the lock on when they were going out for walk the police had asked them to go back home and Correct. they just couldn't uh, spend any time outside this was some of the common issues 
which the family stays uh, in directly providing care for them. And of course, the other issues like loss of livelihood. I've had numerous uh, families who are, uh, you know, daily wage earners who couldn't get money, and mm. and then they couldn't pay for their uh, medicine, uh, and a lot of uh, secondary impact on uh, their uh, care for someone with dementia. Right. And of course, getting the supplies for home and the caregivers' own health and well-being. They are not able to access medical help. They are not able to get uh, exercise themselves. And also looking at uh, the other two important concerns the caregivers had was uh, what will happen to my uh, relative with dementia mm. if I were to develop COVID. COVID. If I were to develop COVID, and right. if I were to go into the hospital, who's going to look after my husband? And usually, that this is the concern of a, a spouse looking after an elderly spouse looking after an elderly person with dementia. Mm. So, what will happen to my uh, husband or wife if I develop uh, um, COVID? And the other important uh, major issue everyone had was stigma. Stigma mm. with COVID, and um, I know uh, in Chennai at least there there were uh, policies which were being enforced in which uh, everybody every house that has a COVID positive case gets a sticker in front of their right. house, right, right, uh, and then and then they get a barricade in front of their mm. house. All this was absolutely creating a lot of anxiety in the families and uh, lots of stigma. And they already have are worried about having someone with dementia, and then having a barricade in front of the house creates more confusion, creates more problems for the family. So those were some of the common challenges which uh, the families faced during this period of time. Right, right. Uh, Mangala, is there anything else that you would like to add, especially because you do talk a lot about cases where the spouse, the caregiver, is a you know elderly spouse. So I think you have yes. a lot of examples like that. Uh, Dr. Sridhar has actually covered uh, this topic in greater details. Mm. But uh, what I noticed was that restriction on mobility was a major issue. And uh, it created a lot of behavioral problems. That's right. One. Then uh, talking about the type of cases that I have seen is that I we had a few wandering cases. And uh, one of our patients, uh, he had a fall and uh, resulting in a severe brain injury and he mm. succumbed to that so that was a sad part of it uh, we had had a few uh, institutionalizations mm. because the caregivers couldn't cope up with the uh, caregiving responsibilities and then there is a lot of guilt feeling because of that so right. that was another uh, part then we had uh, Two of our, uh, you know, caregivers, family members, uh, you know, deaths due to COVID. So uh, not uh, able to meet the relative even mm. during this time. That was another thing. Uh, loss of recreational activities, uh, less socialization. These are another issues. And what I find is that the caregivers are surrounded by so many negative feelings, you know. Mm. loneliness, guilt, irritability, so many of them. And because of that, their mental health is, uh, you know, being affected. They are right. not able to take care of themselves. They don't have time for themselves. There is no help. Then uh, there is a lot of physical work around the home. And, uh, you know, we don't know when we are going to get out of this situation. So pulling on without, uh, you know, maintaining the daily balance mm -hmm. is something uh, they find very challenging. So all of us are hoping that <laughs> this will come to an end as soon as possible. But that's a big question mark. Right. right. <laughs> um, so I think we'll take a couple of questions before we segue into some of the things that you all have tried which have worked right so gomti you know some of the examples of how you all have supported caregivers etc but let's take a couple of the questions that have come in uh, one is i think that somebody is asking you gomti how old was your mother in law when this uh, when she was first diagnosed uh, she must have been about uh, 78 years when she first diagnosed Right. Uh, I went 76. Uh, my father-in-law passed away. So slowly, slowly it started progressing. And when she was 78, we diagnosed her to have Alzheimer's. Right. Right. Uh, Doctor, quick one on that is, you know, does what is the? I mean, is does age have a significance uh, in the diagnosis? Yes. Uh, dementia is associated with increased age. So, right. In fact, age is one of the important risk factors for dementia. 
So as we get older, our risk for developing dementia increases. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everyone who's going to uh, who's older will get dementia. Mm. In fact, if you look at the, the prevalence of dementia uh, above the age of 65, it's only 5%. So 5% right. of people above the age of 65 will develop dementia and 95% don't. I think that's the message that uh, mm. we should be uh, conveying to the people. So 5% above the age of 65. And of course, as the age goes up, so if you look at uh, prevalence above the age of 75, the prevalence is about roughly 10%. Right. So the age, uh, the risk for dementia doubles every decade after the age of 65. So as right. we get older, the risk definitely goes up. But there are rare cases of dementia which can happen in a younger person, usually in their 40s. Uh, the youngest that I have seen is in someone in their 40s, early mm. 40s. Right. Um, but it's extremely rare. Right, right. Uh, one question, are the persons with dementia more vulnerable to COVID-19? Are they at greater risk? Uh, are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. yeah You're yeah. the doctor. Uh, <laughs> sure. um, uh, yeah, I mean, there are issues because of one, their older age. So we know that uh, COVID has a greater impact uh, mm. on persons who are older um, because of various reasons. And still, we don't understand why that is the case. And there are lots of, uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of understanding in the coming years right. uh, in which how COVID is, uh, is impacting on our uh, health and what's happening to us. So yes, definitely older people are at a higher risk. Mm. And especially when someone has dementia, they will have problems with following the norms, like uh, safety uh, norms, uh, like wearing a mask or keeping social distance, right. washing their hands and things like that, which can increase the risk for developing dementia. And often, what we see is dementia doesn't happen isolated in a person. So it's not an isolated diagnosis. When someone has dementia, they usually also have diabetes, usually mm. also have high, may have hypertension, they may have heart disease, they may have breathing difficulties and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's kind of when all these things come together right. in, in someone who is not able to follow precautionary measures to protect themselves against dementia, yes, mm. the risk goes up. And of course, their mortality also will be worse compared to normal population because treating them will be difficult. Uh, mm. Getting them to a hospital will be difficult and they may develop further complications because they can't follow your instructions. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a longish question. I don't know if you can see it, doctor, but basically the person is saying that uh, generally okay, the patient, I think talking about his mother, generally okay, but one problem with her is her restlessness. Uh, totally bedridden, requires help 24 by 7, not able to assess what exactly her problem is. Is it pain? Is it discomfort? Um, so the, the question is what to do about the restlessness. And then he's also tried stopping her memory enhancing medicines uh, since there was no improvement. Uh, so he's asking whether that would be a good idea or not. Sure. Um, see, as the... The, med the treatment for dementia can be considered, the medical treatment for dementia can be considered two broad headings. In fact, I would say three broad headings. Mm. The first one are primarily for improving the cognition. Right. We call it cognitive enhancers. There are different drugs which are available, drugs like uh, donopazil, trivastigmine, uh, galantamine, different, and also memantis. So these are the different drugs which can be used for improving one's uh, memory and cognitive function. Mm. So these drugs, are helpful in early stages of dementia and also in the moderate to severe stages of dementia to an extent. But they do run out of juice after some time because uh, they act on existing uh, neurochemicals in the brain and when, as dementia advances, uh, there is very little that can be done in terms of improving those activities. So that class of drugs are useful in the early stages of dementia, early to moderate stages of dementia. So definitely, that's one of the reasons why I say it's important to get your diagnosis early. And these mm. medicines can definitely make a difference at that stage. Okay. The second class of drugs which are useful in people with dementia are those that help control the behavioral symptoms, the kind, the problems like agitation, restlessness, aggression, uh, sleeplessness, and those kind of things. Now, right. It's important to understand why these symptoms occur in someone with dementia. Right. Uh, the common precipitants for these symptoms are usually a physical cause. So either it could be an unexplained pain, 
uh, undiscovered pain. I mean, obviously, when someone develops dementia, their ability to communicate decreases. They will not be able to tell us they have a headache, they have a backache, or they have a, a toothache. But what we will observe is that they stop eating, mm. or they become uh, less uh, uh, kind of interactive, and they become uh, less engaged in activities. or you may find that they are not sleeping very well so this may indicate the person might be in pain and if you touch them and move them you may get a fierce resistance uh, and you will not be even get close to them to lift them up so those kind of things will indicate that they may be in pain other common things like dehydration uh, very common in um, people with dementia constipation uh, common urinary infections or chest infections these are some of the common physical problems which directly result in behavior i mean i mean uh, just to give you an example the last time you had a cold last time you had a, a minor infection how did you feel you felt miserable you felt bad right okay? but you were able to go seek medical help take medicine uh, and feel better but mm. unfortunately for someone with dementia it's very difficult they need help for uh, to kind of they feel better and get better so they need someone to do these things for them mm. and sometimes it's missed so that can result in behavioral changes right then of course the third important reason why behavior happens is they are not engaged they are just bored mm. uh, and then someone is bored and not engaged meaningfully in doing something we saw this during the covid when we are locked down in the house you're not able to go out and do things that you are doing you you are bored you are kind of numb out of your out, uh, out of your mind so that can cause some behavior they just want to get out they just want to seek some stimulation for their brain right. so these could be, if you have any of these problems then it's important that you address them Right. So, if you can't address them, or if the behavior is so bad, then yes, we can actually give them medicine. Now, these medicines again have a very limited role to play, but can potentially decrease some of the problems. Right. The third class of drugs are general drugs which the person needs, so just to control their diabetes, to control their hypertension, heart disease, and things like that. So, these medicines, if they are missed, they cause problems because. say someone has diabetes they are not taking the medicine frequently obviously they have to use the bathroom more frequently they have to get out get up and go uh, urinate mm. more often that results in disturbed sleep and they may generally feel a bit unwell results in behavioral problems so the medicines can help with those kind of problems also so right. these are the the different types of uh, treatments that are medical treatments that are available so when you deal with someone with dementia whether you decide which medicine is more useful at what stage you have to consider all these things into perspective take all these things into perspective and provide advice so right um we can actually look at this person in the clinic and and see how best we can help uh, at this point in time right thanks and just on that you are um, doing um, telemedicine as well right so people right. can reach out to you uh, right. on okay Full of exam, a few examples of what families can do at home. Uh, for example, now during COVID times, you know, uh, some patients have started uh, drawing activities, coloring activities, and if when they are doing it regularly, we have seen an improvement also. That is, uh, you know, that is what I wanted to get the photographs so that mm. you can see that there is improvement even though they are suffering, uh, you know, from uh, dementia. uh they have been writing or even uh, you know reading some excerpts from the books uh, we have language activities mathematical activities all kinds of there is there is nothing that we don't do really speaking puzzles quizzes jokes all kinds of activities we do and uh, even at home now uh, we have a, a, you know a patient who is a dancer so uh, she has been doing that then uh, there are some uh, others who are doing uh, cooking now they are involved in household chores they are gardening they are going around doing something some task you know which entertain them and another thing here is that that the caregiver has to work with the patient the activity doesn't have to be perfect the activity uh, you know may need some support or some supervision but what is important is an engagement that is important and another thing is never tell a patient you do this mm. it's not you do this it is let us do it together you know if it is done together along with the family as a group activity then the response from the patients is much better and all the family members can enjoy them and they can you know from one activity they can go on to the other one and then uh, they get ideas they become creative and they start with this activity regimen 
and it is good not only for the patient but for the whole family right right thank you mangla uh, gomti can you share some examples of you know some of the activities that you have been doing both with the caregivers and also are you also facilitating these activities with the patients yeah so my mother in law she used to sing so i used to encourage her to sing she loved play card games also she would play with us she used to do the sudoku on the times of india newspaper as soon as it comes she would grab the paper from us and she mm. used to do sudoku she was very good at mathematics she also used to come for yoga classes that is during the initial stage but as the disease started progressing uh, she completely you know lost touch with that she used to scrape the coconut for me mm. and then she used to love that activity she used to love to prepare dosa because she loved to eat dosa she would come to the kitchen to help to make dosa all mm. those activities keep her you know engaging engaging sort of and also happy those right. are the things she like to do so those are the things and in the support group of course we meet once a month and now i am supporting uh, some caregivers who have volunteered to be a part of a four hour program uh, weekly uh, one session uh, only fun activities on a mm. whatsapp call right. because we cannot meet personally so little bit of creative activity little bit of games little bit of fun activities that can be done on a whatsapp call so there are eight caregivers uh, who are engaged with me during the evening time 5:30 to 6 and then 6:30 to 7 so in a batch of 4 uh, so right. eight in a day so just giving them something to do trend and doing different thing and doing things differently that takes them out of their routine stressful work and uh, you know coming and meeting together and sharing and connecting and celebrating mm. so that is what currently that i'm doing so some examples of what you are doing in this whatsapp group in this whatsapp group for example like uh, there is a, if you say a creative number for the caregivers like if mm. i say 3 and then you you shouldn't verbalize the number 3 but then you have to tell it in a way you have to give a clue statement so right. for example if it, it is for number 3 you can say wheels of an auto right. so then they decipher it is number 3 so like that so, so, so those kind of activities and also some fun activities like asking funny questions like uh, if you were a, if you had a super power which super power would you like to have and mm. how would it benefit you so right. some funny questions and some questions that can set them thinking and also enjoyable uh, those are some of the things that i do with them so that's with the caregivers right yeah with the caregivers yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, one question that's come in my mother has osteoporosis so she can't walk now gradually she is pretty much confined to the bed she sits for her food intake three times but during those times we cannot make her sit for more than 15 minutes uh so how to make her a little active i play ludo but what else can i do any suggestions from anybody on the panel sure can i can i quickly sure. answer that question there sure. are, i mean this is a very common problem in elderly because they often as i said come with multiple uh, mm. associated medical problems so we just need to be very creative and uh, and think out of the box sometimes to help them engage So some of the activities could be done in a resting posture. They could sit down or, or you know, lie down and, and do some activities. There are uh, various exercises which are available. If you consult a physiotherapist, they can they can kind of advise on uh, sitting exercises and even bed exercises. Mm. Some of the movements can be passive movements to begin with, and as they develop muscle strength and uh, and uh, they become a little bit more confident, then they right. can do some of the exercises themselves. um it's absolutely essential that you uh, don't feed someone lying down uh, because they can't sit up it's, you can buy a uh, get a recliner bed or prop up uh, on their back with some pillows so that they can sit up uh, and then they can eat I mean they don't have to sit without support they can sit with support uh, mm-hmm. with a backrest and and those are the some of the simple uh, advice that i can give there are uh, plenty of uh, simple um, kind of machines and things which are available right now for exercises um, uh, kind of a pedaling uh, for uh, for uh, like this people for people who cannot walk uh, right. who cannot a uh, bare weight uh, on their knees or their hips they could use a, a, a pedal um, exercise uh, which is currently just you can sit in a chair and you can do that right um, and similarly there are, if if you contact a physiotherapist they should be able to advise you on, on what exercises might be appropriate okay okay um 
Mangala, do you have any other suggestions of activities that she can do? She, she can do activities, uh, you know, like language activities, uh, mathematical activities, depending on her interest. Right. Because basically we have to uh, find activities on the basis of their past and their interest. The right. activities, you know, any kind of games, uh, the family, as I suggested earlier, the family can uh, do some games with her because uh, if she can sit or even though she doesn't sit, you can ask some funny questions as Vomati was saying. Uh, you, you can, uh, you know, have some activities where, uh, you know, you ask some questions and mm or give some clues and ask them to make a story. There are so many things that you can do. And even though she has these physical problems, she can still do things, you know, throwing a ball, she can right. catch a ball and that also becomes an activity. Because I have noticed that uh, even in the later stages, games are still interesting mm. for the uh, patients, you know, even though they cannot do anything else, they can still do this. And coloring activity is also something everybody can do. And right. while coloring, uh, you have to find the drawings which adults can enjoy. Right. For example, geometrical drawings or mandala drawings are some of the things that, uh, you know, uh, elderly people enjoy because they really look nice when you color them and you can mm. really put them up on the wall and show that he or she has done this. Right. So, uh, and they can contact us. We can always suggest some activities for them, you know. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Mangala. Dr. Yeah. Sridhar, did you raise your hand? Or... Yes, I did. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just kind of a quick add-on to what uh, Mangala has just mentioned. I think it's, she's, she's hit the nail on the on its head to, to say that you choose activities based on the person's past interest and their mm. ability. I mean, what they can do at this point in time. So... When we choose an activity, it's important that it kind of simulates multiple uh, sensations. I mean, right. you, you choose an activity which can uh, stimulate their vision, can stimulate their hearing, can stimulate their touch, uh, smell, and taste. So you build in various act activities. Need not only be uh, you know uh, one to one, and uh, it need not be something which you have to actively do with the person. You could, so there are some activities the person can do by themselves. Like mm. uh, when uh, Gomati mentioned uh, her mother-in-law cooking for her or helping with cooking for her. Right. So when you actually cook, it kind of gives you all the, all the, yeah, right. all the senses are, uh, are stimulated. And that's, that's the best way to, to engage someone. And of course, there will be variations when someone is not able to hear very well, then someone cannot see very well. Mm. And this kind of, there are limitations to what they can do. But again, look at what their strengths are, uh, what, what, is, what is it that they do have at this point in time, what their interests have been before, what right. is meaningful to them, and then design an activity. There is, it, it can be tailor-made to any specific situation. You just need to uh, be creative and think outside the box sometimes. Right. So on cooking, right, there's often yeah. a lot of fear that uh, caregivers have that, you know, should I allow them to cook because what if they get burnt and things like that, right? So any comments or any suggestions on that? Uh, Gomti, how did you handle that? Was there ever that concern? Yeah, better to be, you know, uh, doing that under a super supervision. Mm. So allowing them to be in the kitchen so that we are also there. Right. Just have a watch on what is happening. Right. Because as I said earlier, she picked up the phenyl bottle and thought mm. it was milk. That was quite a dangerous thing to do. Absolutely. Luckily, nothing happened. So, but then it is always good to be, you know, supervising them as to what is happening and what they are doing. Right. That right. will help. And allowing them to do what they like. They, if they love to do work in the kitchen, so be it. But then we need to be around. Mm. Mm. Sorry, Mangala, you were saying something. Yes, uh, I wanted to say that music is an all-time favorite activity. And right. uh, everybody loves music. And you can make it more challenging by playing instrumental music because then they start singing the words. You mm. can also have Antakshri, but then you can ask them to find songs with a particular word in it or songs, for example, which uh, relate to the flowers or something like that. You give them clues and mm. then they start uh, doing this and they enjoy it. You know, music activities in any form are right. extremely enjoyable uh, to the patients. And That's they're easy to do. Add. And they are easy, easy to do and you can find variations in mm. these activities. Once you start doing something, then you definitely get different types of ideas and you can uh, change the activity 
is the Correct. same heading but you can do so many different versions of it right right um okay um question for you uh, gomti why is uh, cuz you have created a caregiver group and mangla lal to ask you as well why is caregiver sharing important because often caregivers kind of don't yeah. recognize the value of it they think i have enough to do why should i you know join this group uh, so can you talk about how it you benefited mm-hmm. and what you are seeing as benefits yeah definitely because when my mother was diagnosed with alzheimers and seeing her uh, you know behavioral changes every day was used used to be a new day for me mm. and suddenly there was this article in the newspaper about scarf opening a dem care's wing right at anna sale chennai and uh, that was like it came as a blessing to me because i didn't know like how to cope up or mm. uh, how because always i we felt as a family we felt inadequate so mm. we didn't know what was coming day in and day out for ex- you know she would just sit in the room and then she would suddenly say oh, no the train has stopped come on come on let us go let us go and she will pack her bag and she will come out hmm. so we did not how we did not know how to handle such behaviors and suddenly she will ask in the middle of the night to open the door and go and she wanted to go to her house or uh, at times she will start singing in the night Mm. daytime singing is absolutely okay but when she starts singing in the night when everybody is asleep we did not know how to cope up you know we were feeling so inadequate and a helpless kind of a situation and uh, dem care's wing of scarf came as a blessing for us so there i could meet many other caregivers like me i thought why am i suffering like this so when i met lot many caregivers and the training that we got as for caregivers that was extremely useful and very helpful so that was my first point of contact with dr shridhar when in you know he explained to us through a powerpoint as to how they feel how the patients with our loved ones dementia how their memory works and what happens to them mm-hmm. so all that was a great learning and in the group we would you know monthly once we would cry we would come and we would come only to cry our heart out mm-hmm. so we felt that we are not alone we are supported you know we are we never felt alone after that and then we would contact each other and share our issues and from some quarter there will be some solution you know try this try that for example uh, when my mother in law developed incontinence during the later stages we did not know what to do and uh, we had we had to keep her on diaper because we did not uh, appoint any external caregiver affordability was also an issue with us and we i and my husband and my son all the three of us were and each one of us taking turns to go out and uh, suddenly one person said that why don't you try a pinafer over the diaper so that mm. it is secured from behind so that she cannot remove it mm. so that really helped so this idea came from another caregiver you know who had experience and who shared and this was immensely beneficial for us so that we could you know keep her diaper you know secured in that place so yes. that otherwise she would fiddle it and she would remove it Mm. but that pinafer that help of you know the idea of that pinafer was extremely beneficial and useful and this came from another caregiver so right. like that we support each other so anybody has an issue we talk about it we speak it out and then some idea will you know we we have to just see what works for us as caregivers all our our loved ones have different different issues they are not the same issues Correct. so it works for one may not work for another or what can work at one time may not work another time so since we have these issue it is always good to be in the group you know ask questions and get the answers from some quarter or the other we would get the answers and that is how the support the group has been growing and quite right. well right so just one yeah. question that's come based on your comment gomti what is a pinafer can you describe it pinafer is uh, it like a half pant and it is secured with a belt in the front and mm. behind you can see the young children wearing pinafer style wear of dress for, or maybe in the school i think okay it's called yeah. the, it's like a short it's, short and skirt mix it's like a short yeah right, and it right. is secured with a belt so that it connects your shoulders behind right okay and it is fastened so behind right, so right. it cannot be removed yeah easily by the patient with dementia so okay. that really helped for me right so, so it's got like suspenders stages, we, right so it's suspenders yes exactly right. exactly right. that was very helpful aparna okay thanks thanks um mangala anything else that you'd like to add on that um, what i want to say is that 
many caregivers say that when they look at other patients they feel that we are doing much better than that <laughs> you know <laughs> so, it somehow uh, gives them some kind of peace of mind not only that they understand what they what they can expect in the future right so you know they become mentally prepared also that's mm. another thing right then uh, this support group uh, becomes their alternate family actually because mm. many of them they lose contact with their family members they are not socializing they are not talk because they uh, feel that what is there to talk to them i mean how, what do why, why should we share our sad stories you know with the family members mm. but here uh, with the support group members you know they can share everything they get lot of emotional help over there and uh, they become emotionally balanced mm. besides you know they get lot of information that that's a different uh, story altogether but lot right. of resource uh, sharing also happens you know lot of resource sharing and right now you know our whatsapp support group uh, is so active and so powerful I mean, mm. we started this group four years ago, but the role that it is playing, uh, you know, in the lives of uh, caregivers, I cannot say anything about it. They are there for each other, you know. Right. Uh, right. That is how it is right now. And one question, I think we talked about it as to, but if you can talk about why caregivers should try and learn about dementia caregiving or dementia care. Okay. Uh, first of all uh, dementia caregiving is the most difficult form of caregiving for the elderly mm. you know that is one thing then the issues are very very complex there is a lot to learn every day as gomati was saying that every day is a battle every day you want to know something new how to tackle this situation you just don't know about it right uh, after working for 10 years in this field i still feel that i don't know so much about dementia you know mm. uh, whereas the caregivers are facing the problems we are only telling them they are actually facing the pro- uh, problems and they want to find solutions uh, to it and they want to you know live with it mm. so uh, i i would say that dementia is a very very complex subject mm. and that is why uh, they have to learn so many things and nobody is a born caregiver you know mm. it's a process which evolves it's a caregiver you know if the caregiver wants to care for somebody if that feeling is there that yes this is my loved person and i want to do whatever i can if they have that feeling then they can evolve as a caregiver they can right. be- become a loving caregiver they can learn so many skills like problem solving uh, they have to be resilient they have to learn how to be patient they mm-hmm. have to be analytical so the uh, communication skills because if they learn just communication skills the behavior problems can go down by about 50% so so many things are there that they can think of then they can think about creatively how to solve right. this problem that creativity also comes with right. the sharing and learning and another thing what i feel is that if this learning goes on then only they can keep up with the caregiving challenges Right. without learning without uh, you know having interaction with the experts with uh, you know different professionals they mm. just cannot do it so they need this support uh, throughout the caregiving journey and if they feel that there are people around them who are there for them as caregivers they are standing with them they are working for them then they get that emotional strength to go ahead and continue are uh, doing the job of caregiving right right thank you a uh, couple of quick questions from the audience that have come any suggestions for hallucinations uh, as somebody my mother constantly thinks my father is at home but he passed away 20 years ago or her sisters who are in another city uh, dr shridhar you want to try that first if there anybody else who wants to pop in they can um i think the, this particular symptom is not uncommon in people uh, with dementia believing that someone else who's passed away or who's no longer here 
uh, being with them is a common experience that many people with dementia have. Mm. Now, this we need to we need to uh, clinically examine this carefully and differentiate it from hallucinations. Hallucinations are uh, quite a different uh, set of uh, things. Right. Wherein they actually see someone uh, mm. who is not actually there. So hallucinations can also happen in dementia, and uh, the the treatment of that is, is slightly different. And often the the cause for frank hallucinations that is seeing people, not thinking people, mm. seeing people who are not actually there. Sometimes people see animals, people see things in the right. room that are not there, and things like that. Often that happens because of poor vision. That mm. uh, that when someone develops. Uh, a poor vision due to cataract, common problems in elderly cataract, uh, retinal problems, uh, those kind of things can uh, decrease their vision and can result in then misinterpreting stimuli. They can see a screen and think right. that somebody is there or something is there, or they can see a pattern, a crack in the wall, and say mm. there is a snake uh, climbing up the wall and things like that. So this happens a lot. Right. So the the best way to treat this or to manage this will be to you know fix the crack on the wall. Mm. um improve lighting in the room mm. uh, if you have a better lighting that takes away many of these uh, visual uh, kind of illusions and hallucinations and of course correct their vision so get get them checked by an ophthalmologist uh, get them uh, get their glasses changed if they need a cataract uh, mm. procedure done get that done so those kind of things are things which will advise now despite this if the symptoms persist then obviously there are uh, medicines which are available which can help with these uh, problems So right. that can be done uh, in the clinic, uh, is, but the person needs to be examined carefully and investigated carefully for that. Right. Now, for people thinking or having a memory of someone, so they may still believe, uh, like uh, Mrs. Gomathy said, that her mother-in-law wanted to go and give coffee to her uh, to her father-in-law, the mother-in-law's mm. father-in-law. Correct. So correct. Which they, they that happens because people with dementia sometimes they live in different time zones. They mm. actually they they have forgotten. what has happened in the last say 10 15 20, 20 years depending on how uh, advanced the illness is now what happens in dementia is that people lose more recent memories first mm. but they tend to retain a long term memories for longer period of time until quite late in the illness right so they may forget that they they have lived with their children for a long period of time or that they may forget that their husband or wife has passed away recently mm. they may forget uh that things have changed and, and and they have a new grandchild and things like that but they will very have a clear memory of the time that they were married uh, the time that they, uh, they they were children themselves they went to school and things like that so they when this happens when they time to when they tend to live in different uh, time zones that causes this kind of problem now <clears throat> again this happens because usually when they are idle You, you, if you if you look at the pattern in which this, these symptoms happen, usually you will see they happen in the afternoon, they happen later in the evening. So this is a very usual pattern because that's when people are not being actively engaged or doing much. They they usually have a nap in the afternoon. They get up and then they are a little bit confused. And then of course, come evening, the natural light comes down, and then you have all these artificial lights. And sometimes there is uh, the lights aren't bright enough in the house, and then they get a they get a bit confused about where they are what they are doing and when they are confused like that then they can imagine uh, things they then they go back to what memories they have what is comforting to them and then they kind of talk about these kind of issues so the best way to manage this is to keep them active keep them engaged okay so it comes down to the same thing check for physical illnesses keep them active and engaged and that will actually prevent many of these problems but despite all this if these problems persist then um, they should see a, a specialist and they can kind of guide them and help them in this process right right uh, one quick question may, that's yeah, uh, you want to I add to that uh, mangala like to okay. add something first of all mm. whatever may be the thing that they are saying never contradict them just go by their mm. story that is one that is what dr shridhar was saying also uh, and uh, right. if it is an issue like somebody uh, in the past or if they feel that somebody has just passed away or they are re- reliving that uh, condition again then the best thing is to comfort them that time because their sorrow mm. is real then uh, third right. thing is try to distract them so if we distract mm. them into some kind of other interesting activity then after some time they tend to forget this and they come out of this because i have seen uh, uh, during our activities also 
sometimes patients say that i have to go because my mother is calling me and then uh, mm. we are doing the activities anyway so we tell them that uh, you know we will call up your mother and tell uh, tell her that uh, you are going to be late by half an hour or so and while the person right. is still uh, doing the activities we completely uh, forgets it in about 10 minutes time so uh, distraction right. uh, works best uh, in some of these uh, incidences i won't say uh, every time but at least uh, it's worth mm. giving it a try right right quick one also what calms down a person in the face of extreme agitation and and i'm conscious that we are 5 minutes over time so we'll quickly go through the questions what calms down a person in the face of extreme agitation and irritation talking to them just aggravates in our case um, okay i'll i'll probably start and um, and and uh, both mangala and mr right. can contribute the if you feel that something is aggravating them uh, then remove yourself uh, if you think that mm. it's safe to do so if you believe again as as um, mangala said when it's it's no point trying to use logic trying to kind of contradict them or explain uh, in the sense that oh this person is no longer here why do you want to talk about them that doesn't work it only makes them mm. uh, more uh, angry at you and and they try to prove their point so it it doesn't work right so in in those circumstances if 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 it helps you move away from there and as amangla said all the right thing so try to distract them uh, try to give them something else to do uh, something that will occupy them during that period of time but often prevention is the best strategy if you see this is happening a, a few times then it's best to see what is precipitating them is there a pattern to this when does this happen what brings it on mm. and if you see that pattern then you can try and prevent it from happening again so that's that's the the key but i'll just give you a very quick uh, example there was this lady right. uh, who i was dealing with with advanced dementia her husband had passed away and she didn't know that her husband had passed away she had forgotten that her husband passed away so the, every time she kind of uh, in the afternoons there will be a big breakdown she will become very uh, uh, kind of upset uh, mm. cry and, and all that and it happened that she comes out of her room in the afternoon and then she sees mm. this big picture of her dead husband in the wall right. uh, with a garden right. around it and it brings back the memory of this particular uh, incident and and then she kind of goes through the grief process every mm. day i mean it's they really ring uh, the and going through the process every day so which was very difficult for the family to deal with so the simple advice was to remove that photograph from that point from that place right. and right. and people don't they don't talk about it in the house they don't actively bring that uh, subject and subject. And, and people kind of manage and she didn't actually ask about her husband at all she had completely mm. forgotten if if it is not if she is not stimulated so mm. this is just a very simple uh, kind of an example uh, it it's not that it will work for every person sure. but you can kind of use this as a framework to help someone who may be agitated to understand what is making them agitated and prevent that from happening that's the best way to manage it right right gomti i think i'll ask you this question um if you you know most dementia patients or even elderly people become very repetitive it's the same with my mother she complains of pain hunger or weakness it's difficult for me to understand when it's real and when she's just being repetitive or trying to get attention i'm afraid i should not ignore her when her problem is real how do i deal with this do you have any suggestions yeah uh, so like uh, uh yeah earlier even mother in law you keep on repeating that she has not had food she has not had food so mm. what, initially i didn't understand what how to deal with it so that we would just try to argue with her like just now you had your food and you washed your hands you have had your medicines also why are you coming to the kitchen again to have food then she will get agitated as usual mm. but then later on after uh, uh, you know coming in contact with dem cares and the support group we learned to be in her flow rather than expecting her to come to our flow of things we start you know we trained ourselves to be her flow for example if she would say i have already had food then we would let just leave her at that and come after 5 minutes again and give her food because mm-hmm. later on she would forget to have her food and for uh, morning she would have her breakfast afternoon she wouldn't have lunch and if asked she would say i just had she would mm. have forgotten that she had had food but then we would just leave her at and come back again and maybe after 5 minutes when we go back to our luck she would say yeah she uh, i have not had food please give me food mm. so that was uh, in a sense sort of a blessing because 
that forgiveness became a blessing in some ways because when five minutes earlier when she denied the food later on after five minutes she accepted the food and she had so we just need to keep on seeing what works you have to keep on experimenting right right that is how we did right we Mang- being in her flow rather than expecting her to come to our flow that right. was very important that was a great learning in our caregiving thank you thank you mukumti anything else that you you know mangala or trithar would want to add to that uh, no. i would just say a couple of things uh, if this problem persists then while the person is having food you sit with her and talk with her and say that you are having lunch now we are having this vegetable now we have made something uh, you know in this uh, which you like something you just continue talking about lunch so uh, it falls on their uh, ears or head or whatever you want to say and they uh, kind of remember it for some time but if right. this doesn't help then you reduce portion of the food because you cannot uh, have them overeat also so you reduce the portion or uh, put something on the table which is healthy so they can help themselves these are some of the tricks uh, which uh, we tell them in some cases it works in some cases it doesn't work and as uh, gomati said we have to be really very careful and uh, i would like to add one sentence which our which is a very paid kind of a sentence among our uh, caregivers and that is you have to be smarter than the patients <laughs> <laughs> but if the person is complaining about weakness is there something that you know doctor they should be a bit careful about because yeah definitely i mean there is we shouldn't be ignoring um, the complaints I mean, as i said before many a time we will find that people with dementia cannot actually communicate very well mm. so they may say something actually they may mean something else right so that's very important to keep in mind so even though or they may completely deny anything is wrong with them and something is actually very wrong with them so mm. uh, we have to be very very watchful so uh, when they say that there is something wrong with them it's important to kind of look at it carefully and 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 kind of get them checked out um, at the earliest if you can and mm. and get the proper medical advice for that so don't ignore the symptoms just or or, or dismiss the the symptoms as um, you know they are just saying it to get attention and maybe and that itself is a, is an important issue that needs to be dealt with if it, if they are bringing out physical symptoms or uh, somatic symptoms as a means of getting attention then actually tells a lot about that person so there are things which we can put in place to help this particular uh, person with dementia and also with the family so um so th- there are many things which we can do to help and support this uh, program in this regard i would like to just mention here that there is an intervention called start that is strategies for relatives which is the only evidence based intervention for caregivers of people with dementia it is it has a lot of evidence based developed in the uk and we mm. are now testing it in india so uh, this will be a structured eight week program which the caregiver can uh, go through and mm. that will actually help them understand the the caregiving process better and also the dementia and and uh, about, about dementia and what can be done to help someone with dementia better so this will be a, a program which will soon be available uh, in india and that may be something if anyone is interested in taking part in this they can get in touch with us so when you say get in touch with us how do they get in touch with you they can email me you can okay. provide my email address and they can email okay. me okay so we will add uh, dr shridhar's uh, email id in the uh, notes um i think there's one question are sleeping tablets okay when on dementia medications um okay so I, i'll answer that question mm. um they are not useful um Uh, in in routine um, prescriptions for people with uh, dementia because sleeping tablets per se cause a lot of problems one because they cause falls the people have uh, noticed that when they are on sleeping pills there's lots of research done uh, mm. across the world we have solid evidence based to say that using sleeping pills like benzodiazepines actually makes uh, a person increases the risk of falls for them which potentially when someone falls at that age they can break their bones right uh, particularly their hip bones which again uh, causes a lot of further complications later on so 
uh, that and then also it makes them drowsy during the daytime so when you will find that when people often they are used because people are not sleeping well at night mm. and when you when we use sleeping pills like that uh, on a routine when uh, of course there are certain uh, cases or certain patients for whom uh, this can be helpful when everything else has been tried and nothing else works and they have to be tried under medical supervision carefully but a routine uh, use of medical uh, when use of sleeping pills for someone with dementia is not something that i would advise because one they cause daytime drowsiness which decreases their ability to participate in activities and being active and engaged and mm. two they increase the risk of fall right right thank you uh i think we pretty much i know there are a couple of questions which are very specific around medicine doses etc i think i would suggest that you get in touch uh, one question for you gomti how long did your mother i think you said 10 years but i think there's a question on that uh, uh, how long did your mother in law have dementia and did you also uh, supplement with medication yeah we supplemented it medication also uh, like the early stages uh, after 2008 during the year 2008 it started off very gradually the progression was very gradual mm. and it lasted till about 2018 when she passed away 10 years almost she, right at 86 she passed away yeah okay and medication was there for her you know for her to calm down and especially for the violent uh, outburst you know and the behavior aspect to calm her down there was medication given to her right right uh, somebody is asking my mother constantly asks for tablets should i be giving her a placebo <laughs> uh, again there is no blanket answer yes or no to this um i would advise against it as a routine practice we may have to rather than just looking at it on its surface uh, asking for tablets we may have to go a little bit Uh, below and see why they are asking for the tablets what what purpose does it does it serve here is it anxiety is it uh, you know need for um, getting someone's attention or is it a need for uh, engagement it could be a variety of needs uh, that could be driving this particular behavior so mm. it's important to understand that and address at its root uh, this particular issue uh, of course you could temporarily try and give her uh tablets or or any placebos I, i don't know what placebo is available that you could use um i mean i would be very careful about giving vitamin supplements or uh, you know and things like that because they themselves potentially can create problems so we have to be very careful about using medicines without proper uh, medical advice so um just rather than looking at I mean, any behavior rather than just look at behavior at a surface Uh, we'll have to look at what's driving that behavior what is the reason this person is uh, showing this behavior and if you understand that if you can address that that will solve um, many issues later on right um one question that's come in for you gomti um you know there's this whole um while everybody recognizes that dementia caregiving is challenging uh there is also uh, some level of treating them as you know kind of glorified super humans uh is that something as a caregiver how did you feel about that uh, was that something that was tiring for you or was that something that you uh i guess enjoyed is in in some sense mm-hmm. or did you have a mix of, you know uh, like where in the uh, when there was no support coming from family members for caregiving Mm. so we felt like there was uh, no sympathy there was no empathy also mm. and there was absolutely no appreciation on the other hand you know there were lot of uh, uh, you know tidbits or you know outbursts from family members like see how uh, your how your wife is looking after my mother from the other side of the relationships you know mm. because mm. Uh, whenever they used to come home like uh, they would end up hearing from her that this uh, lady is not giving me any food she is keeping me hungry all the time so mm-hmm. then there used to be lot of complaints like um, what she is looking after my mother she is not at all caring for my mother and all those complaints used to be coming because otherwise she has otherwise as a person she is so kind and very polite my mother in law and all this has happened after coming to you mm. how is it that before that she was quite normal and after coming to your place she has become like this so all that took a toll on our uh, you know equanimity i should say we were 
losing our equi poise and mm. then at one point of time uh, leave alone you know we were craving like for appreciation probably i should accept that some quarter like somebody like uh, tells us oh yeah you are doing a good job maybe that can be there is a thin difference between glorifying and appreciation Correct. probably even glorifying the sense ours was a more challenging task is what we also started feeling as caregivers because every day we were experiencing something new and right. my god this our life itself has turned around hmm. and uh, maybe you know we we were we are entitled for that glorification sort <laughs> of a uh, thinking because nobody else bothered to even say oh yeah you are doing a good job from every quarter we used to receive you know we were into some helpless and hopeless situations apart from the fact that we as caregivers we were all in this together right so, apart from supporting each other from relatives and other people like uh, known people known family people and friends they they did not understand so we need to give that allowance to them because if i were i was not a caregiver and i did not care for my mother in law i didn't know anything about alzheimer's and dementia probably i would have to put myself in their shoes so that right. is how i understand <laughs> right okay thank you I, and i do yeah. i am aware that you know we need to shut this down i know the questions will keep coming um but i think we do we are 20 minutes over time so uh, and i know dr shridhar has uh, a consult to go to uh so i think uh, you know as uh, we will add uh, dr shridhar's email for telemedicine dr shridhar is that again your email or is there a, another contact that you want people to reach out because we've received a couple of requests on that as well yeah email should be fine i mean we can direct yeah. from there okay and uh, uh, mangala any what's the best way for people to contact uh, you or your clinic or whatever the work you do Uh, email is fine email is fine okay so we will put up the email ids uh, uh, and gomti do you want to give out or we just do it through dr shridhar for the dem cares contact yeah anything you can give the email id so the act is that i can't for caregivers i can conduct it for anybody okay for yeah all right that's okay thank you thank you uh, so yes thank you everyone uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time to answer patiently so many questions uh, i i think we have just started scratching the surface there's like so much more to go on this uh, but uh, i think we've made a start so hopefully we'll continue a few more we've talked about this dr shridhar for a long time so it's finally happened uh, but thank you once again mangala uh, gomti and dr shridhar for your time and thank you to the audience for joining uh and if you still have questions you know you can reach us uh, and we will make sure that we connect you to uh, the right resources thank you aparna thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank so you much aparna nice seeing you all thanks very thank much thank you, thank you. Yeah. bye thank you thank you